Hello and welcome to the PPW pod, bringing you news, views and interviews from the world of real estate marketplaces and prop tech. My name is Edmund Keith. I'm the editor of OnlineMarketplaces.com. Joining me today for this special edition is Simon Baker. How are you doing, Simon? I'm very well, thank you. And uh, joining us from Oslo, Norway, we have uh, Adil Osmani. How are you doing, Adil? Doing great. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, um, so I, I'm going to introduce Adil here. Uh, the topic of conversation today is aggregators. Now, we'll get to what aggregators are in a minute because people sometimes get a bit confused about what they are, what they do, etc. cetera. Adil uh, is somebody who ran an aggregator for, I think I'm right in saying, 16 years. Uh, Rubik Group, Rubik Group, unfortunately, very recently ceased operations. We'll get into that. But Simon, myself, and Adil have all worked aggregators uh, and it seems quite a pertinent topic at the moment with what has been going on. Um, before we get into talking about today's subject, which is, I guess, the viability of aggregators going forward, what do we mean by aggregators? Simon, a lot of people get this confused. What is an aggregator? What does it do? Sure. I mean, uh, aggregators at the end of the day will work with multiple portals out there, whether it's cars, jobs, homes, doesn't really matter. And they bring all the content together under one site. Um, I think think something like uh, Kayak is a really great example of this um, and allow the consumer to quickly and easily see the market, do comparisons, filter based on whatever their requirements are, and then when they click on the, the uh, listing, that is the one that seems to be the one they want to execute against, either see more information, book a flight, book a hotel or whatever. They are then taken to the destination site. So at the end of the day, it's all about driving traffic to a destination site so that whatever there's to be done will occur on that site, not on the aggregator site. Okay. And how do they typically make money? Well, the selling of the traffic. I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about what the model of Google is, right, you'll get free SEO traffic through good performance, or you can pay to be at the top of the search. At the end of the day, aggregators work on a, a pretty similar model. They'll give you some free traffic, but if you would like to get you know, the high quality traffic, sometimes that's traffic that's enhanced with additional information, more qualified traffic, you pay on a per click basis. And we're talking in the one, two, three cents, sometimes five cents a click. We're not talking dollars that you can be paying on Google for uh, AdWords. Okay, it's interesting that you said that as if, you know, obviously, but actually, I mean, obviously that is mostly how aggregators make money, but correct me if I'm wrong, Adil, I think aggregators make a lot of money from um, third party, like AdSense and just kind of selling ad space, right? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, I think uh, Simon is is correct on emphasizing the, the CPC model because that is the the dominant one and the one that you can control the most. So uh, in all this, I, I still re recall uh, Mitula numbers clearly moving in that direction where CPC became more dominant. And uh, onto the point now, I I would still opt uh, for for going with that same uh, approach as AdSense is I would say one third to, I mean, maybe 40% of their revenue. However, that's dependent on how good you are at sales, right? So if you're a good salesman, you can get the higher CPC and your the dominant uh, revenue stream will be from CPC. Okay, uh, so we know how they make money now. We're kind of clear on where they sit. They sit above real estate portals in the kind of uh, transaction, if you like. Um, maybe some people won't be familiar with you know, why do they work with, why would a real estate portal want to work with an aggregator? How does an aggregator get a real estate portal's listings? Adil, how, do you want to fill us in a bit on the relationship between real estate portals and aggregators? Sure. So I think that uh, there, there is a different, uh, there is a tier system in, in property uh, portals, right? You have the clear leaders, you have the, the challengers, and then you have maybe the ones who are trying to become challengers. And uh, we we tend to talk about the market as as the number one guys, and what's important to kind of grasp is the number twos and especially number threes have very little room to maneuver in terms of uh, creating that traffic. Whereas buying from an aggregator uh, is a very targeted and efficient method of uh, improving the lead quality and the number of leads to your customers, the agents. Yeah. Okay, so 
we're up to speed now, or at least the audience is up to speed. The three of us have worked at these companies for a long time, we know. Um, but why are we talking about this today? Well, obviously, unfortunately, we had the news of Rubrik shutting down after 16 years, but that's not the only news that we've had recently about aggregators. We also recently, I think last week, had the news that Bing Real Estate, which is an aggregator being run by Microsoft, has, um, let's say, been hamstrung or effectively almost shut down in the US because basically the real estate portals there, Zillow and Realtor.com, let's let's say realize, but I'm not sure realize is the right word. They kind of, um, it got back to them that their agents weren't very happy, let's say, with their listings being on this service. And so they effectively said to Bing, you can't use our listings anymore. And that's kind of, let's let's say, killed Bing Real Estate in the US. Um, but also the other major player in this space, which is Life Will Connect, which we'll talk about later. Um, they're a public company. They show their numbers and we obviously report on their numbers. They've not been doing too great uh, over the last, well, let's say 18 months or so. So it's quite a, um, a timely thing to be discussing. And Simon, I want to get your input on what do you see for this model going forward? Do you think it's kind of maybe run its course or is there a pivot or is it just a question of weathering the storm? Okay. So, so let's, let's break these down. There's a chunk of stuff. First of all, I think Bing is, is it, yes, it's an aggregator, but it's different. Um, and the way you have to think about it is um, all, all search engines or so, sorry, portals, doesn't matter what it is, cars, jobs, homes, um, Amazon, right? You have three three pages, three things: the search, the listings page, the details page. Okay, and then off the details page, they usually get an action, right? Buy something, create a lead, whatever. Okay. Now, the Matulas, Troverts, Rubrics of the world are two pages: the search, the results, the listings, and it goes to someone else's details page. So you want to see the pictures of the house. You want to see the details of the job. You, you go to that site. Bing sort of put in the third page. Okay, so they had the details page on their site. And but you did still click through to the portal. That is worth mentioning. Yes, yes, you did, but only when you wanted to do an inquiry. Now, what that means is the portal is used to controlling that page. That's where they make their money. That's where the agent has paid to put their listing. That is where you can put other branding from a mortgage or whatever. Now Bing was taking that page. So Bing had was, I, I would say, was too greedy in the, the how far down the value chain it went. So, I, that's, so Bing was different from Rubrik or from, from Machula or so on. I think, Adil, you, you would agree with that point. So I, and, and the other thing that comes into play in the US is the MLSs and there's so many rules and laws and requirements about what can and cannot be presented that if you're taking data from Zillow, shoving it on Bing at the details level, you're, you're probably breaking some rule for some MLS system because remember there's like 900 of these things out there and they've all got different you know, variations on a theme. So if I'm Zillow or, or, or Realtor.com or whatever, I'm going, I don't want my listings on Bing, because at the end of the day, if there's a problem, the MLS is not going to go to Bing, it's going to come to me, and I'm going to have a headache. So it's not worth it. And by the way, okay. and by the way, Bing is really small. So I'm better off saying, go away, leave me alone, don't scrape my listing. So I, let, let's take them out of the equation, first thing. Okay, fair enough. I'll take yeah. your point on Bing. Um, we're yeah. talking about them in the past tense, they still exist in something like 10 countries, I think. Um, oh, so yeah. they're, you know. But because it's not the US, right? And the US is a unique beast. And we always try to put too many things in one big bucket and call them all the same and it's all different. You, but your other question around is the model dead, right? which is the, the more interesting model. Um, I don't think it is, but I think it, you've got to think more carefully about it. And, and yeah, the, the way the model sort of fundamentally works is um, give me your listings, Mr. Uh, Portal, and I'll aggregate them all. And I'll focus on the long tail um, SEO. So someone's putting in, I want a three bedroom, two bathroom, this, that, with a blah, 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 blah. And then 
you know, rubric will have thought about that. We'll have one page that's automatically generated by some big algorithm. And that page might get clicked once every three months, right? But there's millions of these things, right? And try mature to the same. Whereas the REAs, the right moves and so on, they're worried about real estate in Richmond, right? Of which, a deal, correct me if I'm wrong, you're never going to be able to compete at on the yep, Google. totally correct. Okay. Yeah. So they're going for that big thing. Now, the, the big issue is Google's gone, you know what, I think I'm going to change the algorithm a bit. And, and when, when, when Google sneezes, we all get a cold is the, the blunt way to think about it. So, and, and I guess that's what, what's part of what's happened to Dylan in, in your business is that Google's sneezed and you've, you've, you've caught COVID. Yeah, exactly. And I think that um, to kind of, I think the analogy is, uh, is spot on, right? So let's say that Google sneezed uh, along, uh, I mean, the fall of 2023. And then uh, maybe and we caught a cold, but uh, they had an update in in March where I, you know, I'm sure we have all uh, all looked at this right. That Google is now trying to catch up on the AI race. That is uh, where Microsoft actually took took a leading role with OpenAI, and I, and this is something probably Simon you can you can attest or or or, uh, or talk around. But for me, the overall picture is like. Google has sneezed at such an effect where I'm starting to think is Google a search engine or a content provider or where are we heading here? And that direction from an aggregation space uh, is challenging because the, uh, the frequency of the sneezing is now becoming worrisome. Uh, what do yeah. you think about that, Simon? I, I, I agree. And, and the problem is you have to continue to rethink your model a little bit right? You yeah. have to, and and, and mm. you need these micro changes, micro changes, micro changes, mm. because a high percentage of the traffic is reliant on Google. Now, the, the question is, Ed, how do you uh, immune yourself from this? And there's, you know, one is on the, the, the traffic generation side is you have to build a brand, okay? But that takes many years. And you have to think about what the brand is, what does it stand for, you know, and so on. And I think most um, vertical search players didn't didn't really in, didn't invest in that because it's very hard when you're operating in. I think you're like ten markets a deal. Mm. And how do you build a brand across ten markets across cars, jobs, homes? Well, it's hard, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Super hard. Mm. So then then you got to think. Well, I'm still getting traffic because so you don't go from a hundred to zero. You go to hundred to maybe thirty or forty or fifty, right? You have to mm. think, how do I modify the model in such a way that I, I now am um, making money from a different source? Mm. And, and, and if you look at the value chain from real estate, because we're talking about real estate in this, in this podcast, you are either making money on the clicks, the traffic generation to a portal, you're making money on the advertising on the portal, so whether the listings get put on and display advertising, mm. or you're making money in the transaction. So the agent makes money in the transaction, spends part of that to advertise on the portal. The portal spends part of that to buy traffic. Mm. Okay. So you've got a value chain. The question is where in that value chain do you go? And I think that's the challenge. You, and, and, yeah, and also, got, if, sorry. Yeah, if I, if I may chime in, uh, Simon, I think also uh, it, the complexity is finding a part in the value chain where you don't effectively stomp on the feet of your largest customers, which are the dominant portals, right? Uh, so, so if you go, I'm going to sell data or I'm going to come in and talk to your customers, the real estate uh, agents, now as an aggregator, you're getting into some troubled waters. Yes. Yeah. And All right. I was going to I'm say that, that Ed, Ed, Ed I, mean, I think, and I think this is, this is a good example, Adil. I mean, you, we all know that indeed. Right, and they're the yeah. they're, they're the poster children who actually took that leap. Yeah, I agree. In the jobs job mm -hmm. sector, where they they started as an aggregator, and then they said, "Fantastic, we're making sort of this amount of money, sending leads. Now I'm going to become the the uh, portal myself, exactly. and and, mm -hmm. and the people can advertise their jobs on there. The fundamental difference is that in um, uh, jobs." Um, 
a lot of the people advertising jobs are the end consumer. Think yep. of it as a for sale by owner in real estate. I'm a mm. company. I want to employ 10 people. I either give it to a recruiter. So the recruiter is the equivalent of the real estate agent, or I've got my own in-house team. I've got an HR department and they all apply for the jobs and do the filtering myself. In mm. real estate, you know, massive percentages go through the, the equivalent of a recruiter. In jobs, the vast majority are for sale by owner. If you think about it in that logic. You know, mm. if, if everyone was selling their house and no one used a real estate agent, you, Adil, tomorrow could convert rubric into an advertising port. Exactly. Okay. Mm. And that's the fundamental difference you've got to, you've got to We're dealing in a world where rubric is an intermediary, the portal is an intermediary, the agent is an intermediary. A lot of intermediaries between the buyer and the seller. I'm interested, Adil. Um, so when I thought about this subject and I, you know, when I was working in the industry, I kind of thought about this subject from two sides. You've got Google trying to crush your business from one side, trying to become an answer machine rather than a search engine. Right. But I imagine you've also got the portals from the other side thinking, hang on a minute. Isn't this traffic I could be getting anyway by just improving my own SEO? What was the relationship like between you guys and real estate portals and how do you kind of convince them of your value as they probably start to wake up and realize that actually they can invest in doing some of these things and cut you out? Right. That's a, a great question. And Simon kind of touched base on that uh, slightly earlier, right? So, so first off, you just go straight to them and you create a relationship. So, so going at it like Bing did in the US for me is... Uh, uh, staggering, basically. I mean, you should, you should just go to the guys and talk to them, explain the situation and how you can directly help them in, uh, in kind of filling those gaps in traffic uh, that they cannot do themselves. So, so a typical example is uh, I got a customer who is a realtor in a small city in the outskirts of Australia, and I am unable to fill his leads needs. Okay, I'll go to Rubrik and I'll buy those leads. I'll make that one customer happy and everyone is okay, right? On the other hand, uh, there is usually a myriad of uh, sites out there and they should all be betting on, you know, uh, short tail, mid tail or long term traffic, long tail traffic. But as Simon uh, said, there is much more value on top. It's the brand building, it's the funnel, it's spending time on your portal. Well, we are just uh, a little bus stop on the way to the next, uh, to the end journey, which is buying the house. And we are just crystal clear on that purpose. We don't kind of try to do the one or the other. We just talk to the guys and say, listen, uh, this is what we do. We will stay in our lane, right? We won't talk to your customers, but we can help you fill these needs. And then you have a back and forth uh, discussion on when they have high need, low need. Uh, but usually we are able to convince them that we are your friend and uh, not your foe. Okay. Um, was there, I mean, cause, I mean, to confess, we've all worked in this industry. We've all kind of, we know the answers to all these questions, but I'm really interested. Was there, did you ever get kind of um, portal saying you need to remove my content? So I'm thinking about the, the Bing example. And what yes. are the legalities around it? Because this is all governed, if I'm not mistaken, by the kind of the fact that nobody's ever successfully sued Google for crawling their listings. So you as an aggregator rubric, you obtain listings, I imagine, either through an XML feed or in many cases through crawling, which is exactly what Google does. Right. So there's no legal precedent. No one's ever said, no, Google, you, you can't do this. Remove my, my listings. Right. What are the, the kind of legalities around it? And would you ever remove stuff if you didn't have to? Yes. So I think there are, there are two parts of that, uh, that I would say, uh, problem. And as one, if you, if you carry someone's content, uh, and they don't want you to, uh, they're never going to become my customer, right? That's the first one. There are different sets of legal rules and I'm not a legal professor. So just kind of, you have one set of rules in the European union. There is very different rules in Canada, us and Australia, actually ancient uh, sets of laws but you're not you're not legally able to reproduce that content but on the other hand i would say that and Mitula led in this area if you just stay on it in my opinion if you're a good value creator and a salesperson 
they will understand and you will kind of get back to the to the conversation where you say listen isn't it a, isn't it a strategic value for you that we send you traffic and for some reason if there's not we just started leaving it and moving on basically and that was kind of the part of the maturing that Metula drove in those days and that curve for me really changed over the last years so there were examples, but they were, I can count them on one hand. Okay. Um, so to get back to the other side of this equation for a minute to Google, what specifically was Google doing? So I used to work in SEO for one of these companies and we would always, you know, the sky is going to fall on our heads tomorrow, right? We always thought that Google was going to release an update and it was going to crush us, right? It seems that something like that has happened, but we always found that these long tail search results, actually Google never really played around with them and they were all, they were always kind of the same. What mm. happened in, did you say March this year? Yeah, so kind of uh, to kind of uh, go with the analogy of, of Simon. So they started uh, sneezing for our part. So first we have been watching Lifeful being, uh, let's say hit by the Google algorithms for quite a while. Uh, we were doing quite well actually until October, 2023. And then we started seeing some changes in our end. Uh, and in March, it really hit us. And I think it's, uh, I think it's really hard to pinpoint. I mean, what is it exactly? We didn't really change anything. Uh, our product was at an all-time high. What that means is removing advertising, putting on statistics, really kind of trying to help uh, the user, watching metrics go up in engagement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so I think that uh, so from our end, it was also realization of the change that Google, in my opinion, have now attested to driving. So, so yes, I agree. You could always micro adjust, you could rewrite, you can redeploy, uh, but there is something in the air now, which I feel is a fundamental shift. And I've had the discussion with, uh, uh, let's call it, uh, people who have been in our industry for a long time saying the same thing. Uh, I do agree with Simon. I don't think the, the game is up. But I think the, the necessity of diversifying uh, is, uh, is definitely now at least on par with SEO, whereas in the old days, you could just focus there. Yeah. Now we, what's interesting is I, I um, always remember sitting on a flight from uh, Melbourne to Madrid next to Gonzalo de Pozzo, who was the CEO of um, Machula Group at that point, and we were talking about what's next. How do you... Now, we, we were trying to really fundamentally solve the question, how do you reduce your reliance on CPC? You know, A, Google at one end, and B, making money off of fundamentally clicks at the other end. And out of that was, was born a, a strategy which said, how do you get into portals in select markets? And how do you then get um, in even deeper markets, get into transactions? And what's interesting is if you look at what um, occurred, so, so when we were at Machula, we bought dot property in Thailand um, as an experiment. How do we buy this? How do we drive traffic to it? Can we, can we give them an, an, a, a, an unfair advantage? Okay. And if, well, if, as unfair, an, an advantage vis-a-vis -vis other portals by redirecting to them the non-paid for clicks. So you sell the clicks, you might sell 70% of clicks, we'll redirect the other 30% to them. So they could then monetize at a classified advertising level. And, and then the next step was then to get into the transaction. And Lifeful took that the step further and got into the transaction with the acquisition of Fuzzwise in Thailand. And now, of course, that's, that's actually the fastest growing part of their business. When you look at their, their, their numbers and you talk to the guys there at Fuzzwise. And what they're demonstrating, and now this is like everything, it's not a wake up in the morning and it's solved by lunch. You know, this is wake up in the morning and three years later, you've incrementalized 1% improvement you know, every week to get to a far more efficient transaction model than if you're going by the traditional route of being an a, 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 um, agent, advertising on the local portal, you know, and buying your traffic and doing it yourself. And really that's what it's all about. Okay. It's how do you get to that end game, be far more efficient, 
at, at, at high volumes of transactions where you're making five, ten thousand dollars per transaction. And by the way, your um, unit cost economics is such that you're making 40, 50 percent on every sale versus the other guys who have to spend more on marketing or spend more on people because they're chasing dead leads or, or, or so on. So that's all the things that go into this, the way you have to think about this whole um, equation. And that's where you, you know, a deal, you, could, you can leverage to, you know, your intent markets, you have traffic, um, how do you flip the model? So you know what, you guys don't want to buy it, I can't do it, but I'm going to take the, the um, direct traffic and they're still, because Google doesn't go to zero, but then how can mm. I convert that into transaction-based traffic in those 10 markets that you're operating? Yeah. I, I totally agree, and I think that, uh, I mean, what uh, Mitula started and then Life will continue this is a great example of how we can build a, almost like a vertical industry integrated uh, player in a country. Uh, and uh, what's happening in Thailand is, of course, uh, interesting, but I would have to say, uh, but uh, Simon, do you see this happening in any market which is even slightly entrenched? Thailand was kind of open, wouldn't you agree? I think... Um... You, you have to be smart about the segments you go after. And for me, the, the segment I love most is the new development segment. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I remove one part of the problem, which is mm. I don't have to deal with a home seller. I deal yeah. with a economically motivated seller, mm. right? Because every, every developer is there to make money, right? They are not there to um, worry about the emotional attachment to their property which is what you have when you're dealing with private sellers in this process. Yeah, for sure. And mm. that, is, that is sort of the real underlying thing you have to think about is you can work with a developer who's going to – and you probably get a higher commission. Oh, yeah, for you sure. You can get 5% and so on. So mm. I think there's uh, many other ways of thinking about you know, how you do that. And you, the question is if you can get more new, de new developments in um, you know, the Nordics or other places, then you can have a real business. But if you've got to deal with individual home sellers, which means you've got to have real estate agents, and there's a lot of, remember the other, the other fundamental issue is you're dealing with people who are so inexperienced in selling their homes that you, you have to um, put people on the ground, boots on the ground, and you can't get the scale efficiencies. So there's a lot of complexity in this whole end-to-end -end way of thinking about it. But that's why the, the Thailands of the world work really well. A lot of, a lot of Asian countries, a lot of uh, Latin American countries, you know, the LIFL's uh, very deep into uh, Mexico with the acquisitions of uh, uh, the Moody in that market. Um, mm. They've also got Resem, which was a company that, that, that Machula had operating in, in, in emerging markets. And it's all about you know, drive traffic to markets that are relatively inefficient. But there's still opportunities, I think, in those mature markets as well. I'm interested, Adil. Um, I know at my time at one of these aggregators, we would always there'd always be a new project, right? There was one a couple of months we tried to get into mortgage leads. There was another month we tried to um, do something with jobs. I, what were there? Were there a lot of these pivots that you guys tried, or was it very pragmatic? Actually, you know what? This isn't. You know, there's no point trying to do something that we're not good at. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. I would say that uh, so we try to be uh, as uh, as razor sharp as we we meant we should be in that sense. So we took a pragmatic view at uh, both Michula and uh, and Lifeful, meaning at that time Trovit, and us respecting the operational capability of Michula, we kind of looked at it and said, okay, uh, if this takes this much time, effort, and capital, and they are still at it it means we shouldn't do it. Uh, and we looked at other industries and we looked back and forth and we kind of arrived at similar conclusions. However, we did explore several opportunities on the data side of things where I believe there is a possibility for uh, an aggregator to actually create significant value. There is a clear cut uh, value there. There are customers, there's a market. Um, but unfortunately, we never got that train going. I think that's uh, one of the things which is kind of left on my the back of my uh, my napping and saying, okay, so kind of uh, thinking of of the flights that uh, that Simon was talking about with Gonzalo, 
Uh, we had a lot of those conversations, a lot of customer interviews, and I am convinced there is value there. And that is actually a viable path for an aggregator. Okay. Yeah, the, you the, want to tell us what it is, or are you going to keep it <laughs> tight lipped? I am pretty sure Simon has de delved into those things as well. Uh, but again, you are at, you're sitting in the intersection between selling traffic, but also gives you uh, the first party view of a lot of ads, right? Remember that the competition that are selling data today, they are crawling because they don't have a natural attachment to the portals. And this is what gives you the really good advantage of the data side. The, I think the, the way to think about it is, you know, the, in, in rubric as an example, the consumer touches you first. Mm. Right? They, 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 they end up on you. That's when they start to really think about the search. And if you can track what they're looking for, you, you get to know a couple of things. One is you get to know what people are searching for in what areas, which becomes incredibly valuable information to someone like a developer. Secondly, you get to know a lot about me as the searcher. So if I just look at a couple of things and then disappear, I'm probably a tire kicker and I'm not, I'm not serious. So don't, waste your time. But if I keep going through a whole bunch of different listings, it's unlikely I'm going to go from a $10 million place to a $200,000 place. I'm going to look in a range. I'm going to look. So you suddenly know a lot about me as an individual by what I do. Now, if you can find a way to know who I am, put attribute to me, this data, and then package that up to either the portal itself or to the to someone who's going to use that. And the problem is people actually using the data, right? Because we can, we can all draw beautiful PowerPoint presentations that look amazing at, at all this theoretical, wonderful opportunity, but mm. the 99% of people don't do anything with it. Yeah. Now, this is where AI comes into the equation. Now you can, you can start to imagine a world where if you assume that the end user, I mean, the end user has got to be the real estate agent, right? The person who's interacting face-to-face -face with you, Ed, if you're selling a house or Adil, if you're buying a house, right? If you can create for them the capacity to almost do augmented reality, wipe you know, the phone over you and it goes, you're a nine out of 10 for selling or buying in the next three months. Hmm. Um, I know what you're selling. So, you know, I wipe it over you, Ed, and that's a, $10,000 check to me. So if I can, I know that $10,000 is you, right? Now, I don't know if a lot of people think this ruthlessly in the whole approach or with a deal, if you're walking around and I know you've, you've just had a baby and you've now need, you know, a bigger house and you've got a, got a, <laughs> a new job, right? Or whatever, right? Hmm. But I, and, and I know what you're looking for because you're not going to be looking for stuff that you can't afford. Hmm. You're also a check that's walking around for me. Yeah. Right. And, and, and if I can somehow take that information, shove it into the hands of the person who's going to execute it mm. and just say, Ed's a $10,000 check, Adil's another $10,000 check. Well, it's actually the same check to be honest, right? Because you're going to buy the house and I'm going to get paid as the agent. Um, mm. And by the way, I've got a, a hundred percent um, confirmation rate that Ed is going to sell in the next three months because I know he has a new job in, I don't know, insert the place, Alberta, right? I don't know where, why Alberta. Right? Okay. And Adil, I know that there's an 80% uh, uh, chance you're going to buy in that period of time. Then I want, then I'm, what I'm fundamentally doing is taking what is a, almost like a, a shotgun approach that agents yeah. use today on very small data and a lot of hope and converting it to high data, but presented in a very uh, simple way, right? Traffic light green, traffic light green, talk to these guys. Orange, mm, it's going to take a bit of a while. Don't worry, the AI is going to do that work for you. Red, don't waste my time. Mm. And it's, it's, if you can do it that simply, then you, you're really creating value. And I think I do what you're getting towards with data is that you have the capacity to fulfill a lot of those needs. Yeah, and I think you're spot on, Simon. I mean, uh, considering now the new uh, Cook directives and Apple shutting down the transfer of uh, tracking from one device to another, it is increasingly hard for, let's say, uh, tier three, tier two portals to get that picture in order to understand 
what uh, kind of what who are my customers how are they moving and of course being an aggregator you can actually tell them listen why don't i market your property i'll sell it send the click directly to you but i actually have the user data as simon correctly says because we have millions of notifications emails and we know exactly what they want because they're telling us right so there is a there's a good relationship there and, and i would say there are two parts of the data one is what simon correctly identified the, the first party knowledge of people qualifying them nurturing their leads the other is the just the vast amount of ads you have so imagine that you uh, that you have all the ads in the market let's do germany right because you get the feeds from you know uh, from uh, from data vintas you get it from scout you get it from Immovelt. Now you can understand by looking at advertising time, what is moving in which markets and how fast and at what seasons, right? If you package that data, you can actually put it back to the portals, to the agents and give them some really real time intelligence. What goods is moving right now in your market? Okay. Um, I want to push back on this a little bit, both. If I've got this right, you're both saying that there is definitely a future for aggregators, right? But it might lie slightly in slightly different things. So what you're saying, I deal about using the data and packaging it and having portals sell your knowledge to the consumers. What you were saying, Simon, about using an aggregator, like for example, in Thailand to fuel uh, another business further towards the transaction, right? I understand the business cases for this, but surely all of this is predicated on Google still giving you traffic, right? Um, it seems as though that's not going to like, there's going to be less and less traffic. Uh, just to quote you some figures from LIFO, um in Q2, so their most recent filings, they admitted that their aggregation business had seen a 33% year on year drop. Um, not to be like the harbinger of doom, but both of those business cases kind of rely on Google, isn't it? Uh, fair to say that unless that trend you know reverses there's not much of a future if i could kind of just browse the subject i think uh i think we can i think one might have to rethink so one uh talking about simon says there is a lot more value in the development part is there something you can do there to create the value so i think that i would challenge that an seo based model only might have some set but there is room to kind of exploit what is there uh, and maybe package it with other business models yeah i i think no, actually i agree first of all Ed, if if i said there's a 33 percent drop the question is not the 33 percent. it's from what to what is it from 100 million to 66 million well Give me 66 million and I can do a fair bit with that. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, we've always got to be a little careful on just looking at headline numbers because that, that, you know, you often then can sometimes panic and, and markets panic and people who don't understand panic and so on. Um, it's, it's like everything you, you have to get innovative around it. You can be, you know, the, the, the Kodaks of the world who used to have wonderful cameras or made film or whatever, and you, yeah, the market dropped. Yeah. So did you pivot? Mm, we didn't pivot. We didn't take what we had, which was a user base or a knowledge experience start, or you can be Canon, right? Sure. Again, the digital really fast and so on. No, markets are always changing. What it comes down to is, A, do you have the capacity to see what is coming because you're close enough to it? B, do you have the opportunity to prepare for it? Okay. And I would argue that we went down that path with, with Machula when we uh, bought um, yeah, Dot Property and had Resem and did a whole bunch of stuff. C, do you have the resources to execute it? And, and I would have it a guess, a deal that you may, if you run out of money, you haven't got resources because you need oxygen, right? Got to go, exactly. got, to, got to ride the, the hump or the, not the hump, hmm. the, uh, the dip, right? Yeah. Come out the other end. But D, probably equally as important, you've got to have the organization structure and, and organizational intelligence, motivation, or culture to um, 
not get wedded to an outcome, not bulk yourself in systems and processes. And, and, and I would argue that, that probably what's happened with LIFEL is that they became too wedded to one outcome or maybe too fragmented or didn't, didn't execute as well. And so if, you've, if you're too reliant on that old CPC revenue and you don't, and, and the word's not pivot, pivot in, implies changing completely, but you expand and innovate around that, then you become less reliant. And so if you do have a dip in traffic, you're now, instead of getting on average, I don't know, one cent per click or one cent per visit or whatever the, the metric is, you're now getting five cents per visit. Well, if I'm getting five cents per visit, I can mm. afford to have half my traffic half. I'm still ahead. Okay. And that's, that's how we would think about, you know, what is the value that I can extract from a visit mm -hmm. to the website? Yeah, and I, I can share already that uh, we were actually able to get that message across to our customers. So just kind of tiptoeing around the CPCs you mentioned earlier, Simon, we were able to extract twice, three times those numbers in select segments, right? As you are addressing, yes. right? So you need to start getting smart about where you're asking for that extra money. Uh, and you need to not pitch it, but explain it. And then we will measure it. And then we will keep that run going. So we were we were able to make, uh, I would say, substantial revenues uh, with the property portals on development only. But of course, we said, listen, this is great. We understand why you want to work with us on this only. However, let's get real about the value here. The lead value here is 10x. So let's do 5x. And for us now, that starts that starts to make sense, right? Hmm. Uh, and Ed, to kind of just go a bit back, I mean, I think I can agree that the traditional aggregator model, uh, SEO pure play only, is going to have a challenging time going forward, uh, for sure. And that is, of course, part of the decision uh, for me to uh, to recommend that we cease operation, right? So. I'm fiscally responsible to the shareholders. And at the moment, I cannot put a plan forward where we can, as Simon said, you know, weather the storm. Uh, I am forced or should at least uh, take that decision and make that recommendation. And that's what happened. And I think, I think there's, there's an underlying message around all of this um, is that when, when a, lot, a lot of the time when businesses are doing well, they um, keep going, they double down, triple down quadruple down on, on what they're doing, which probably makes a lot of sense. What they don't do is put a bit aside for a rainy day, almost like self-insurance. What happens if something goes wrong? And they also don't innovate. They're not, almost not, not willing to, to, to you know, um, kill, kill their own to get into a new market. And, 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 and it can be selective. It might be homes for sale in... Uh, Thailand, we're no longer going to do CPC in that market. What we are going to do is only drive traffic to one website. Mm. Okay, and, and a lot of people panic around that. They're not comfortable with taking that that fundamental decision to to do that. And and you know when when you're when you're a business that just is that one trick pony, okay, eventually the pony stops doing the trick. Okay, and if you haven't taught other things, other tricks, or, or or whatever, you're going to get caught with a problem. And I think that's where what 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 can happen. And if you you don't have the money to write out, so then you've got to take a step back, maybe recapitalize or whatever, and hmm. the deal ends up doing. Yeah, but coming, but you, but all those lessons after. I mean, you you know a hell of a lot, right? Sixteen years, you've learned so much. It's ridiculous. Hmm. Okay, and now I it's think that's case. exactly correct. Yeah, so. Uh, so, yeah, that's clearly correct. I mean, I think you need to be on your toes every day, uh, try to move in a di different direction uh, as long as you can, right? So I, I have this analogy of uh, a boat that has some speed. So as long as you have speed, you need to try to maneuver because the moment your oxygen runs out, meaning your boat loses speed, it's hard to go left, right, or even forward. I mean, you, you're out of opportunities, right? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Guys, we're about to hit 45 minutes. I think we'll leave it there. I think this is something that the three of us could go on talking about for quite a long time. Um, Simon, thank you very much. Adil, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate you coming on and uh, best of luck to whatever comes next for you and for all uh, the people 
uh, of Rubrik. If anyone out there is hiring, there's a lot of very, very good people on the market right now. Um, do a lot worse than, than hire some uh, former Rubrik employees. Thank you very much to both of you and um, we'll see you again soon.